things break up. There are actually unfair contract terms regimes in both the ASIC Act and also the Australian Consumer Law. That's right. And the unfair contract terms regime in the ASIC Act relates to financial services. Correct. And the unfair contract terms regime in the ACL refers or deals with effectively every other aspect of the economy. It does. And in your statement, you tell us that in January and February of 2014, the ACCC worked with Treasury and the Department of Finance and Regulation to prepare a new policy proposal submission to obtain funding in relation to the extension of the UCT provisions to small businesses? That's correct. And that was, as we understand it, before the legislation that was going to extend the unfair contract terms regime to small business had actually come before Parliament, is that, that right? That's correct. All right, so the, the ACCC had begun already at that stage working with Treasury to obtain funding, what, in 2014? Is that right? Yeah, that's right, January and February uh, 14. And as a result of that submission in the 2014 to 15 budget, the ACCC was allocated an additional $1 million of funding over three years. That's right. And that was to undertake compliance and education activities in relation to the extension of the UCT to small business? Correct. All right. And we're going to come to some of your activities in a moment, and I'll return at the end to the question about how the funding affected those activities. There was some additional funding that you obtained in the 2017-2018 budget. And continuing. And what is that funding? Uh, that was effectively the final year of the three-year funding uh, rolled over an ongoing basis. And so that's $417,000 That's year. correct. All right. And the Amendment Act, which extended the unfair contract terms regime to small business contracts, received royal assent on the 12th of November 2015. That's right. And you tell us in your statement that before royal assent, the Commission had begun developing an education and compliance strategy in relation to the anticipated new laws. Yeah, yes, we had. And I just wanted to understand, though, that presumably doesn't fall within your section of the ACCC, is that right? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, so we have different divisions, uh, as you would imagine. Um, uh, that was uh, through our compliance and small business uh, division. Uh, but I work quite closely with them, particularly in relation to matters that uh, might ultimately have uh, an enforcement angle. And in this case, when you say ultimately have an enforcement angle, that's to indicate that ultimately once the... Is it the compliance section, is that what it's called? Indeed. It might move, matters might move away from the compliance section and start being enforcement matters. Or a parallel track where you're both doing compliance work and uh, also enforcing the law. All right. And you tell us in your statement at paragraph 4.1 that the ACCC adopted what you've referred to as a two-stage approach in relation to the introduction of the UCT provisions for small business contracts. Could you just, perhaps if we take each stage in turn, could you explain to the Commissioner what the first stage of the approach was? Certainly. So the first stage was particularly focused on that 12 months between royal assent and when the, uh, the laws would come into effect. Uh, and we took the approach there of uh, educating, uh, working with business and outreach activities uh, to build both awareness in the community of businesses that had contracts with small businesses, uh, but also small businesses so they could be attuned to the type of issues to look for. And... When you say prior to the legislation taking effect, that was, what, the 12th of November 2016? That's that correct. Right? All right, so there was a, a one-year period from royal assent in, on the 12th of November 2015 to the 12th of November 2016 when your first stage was in operation? That's correct. And then what was the second stage of the approach? The second stage was moving towards more of an enforcement focus. While we'd still have outreach, communication, education activity ongoing, uh, we would be looking at matters that were drawn to our attention through our normal enforcement investigation lens. And that would commence from the 12th of November 2016? That's right. All right. And I think one of the things you explain at paragraph 4.1b of your statement is that the ACCC's view was that once the legislation came into force, the Commission would move swiftly to an enforcement approach. That's right, Mr Hodge. And 
could you explain what the rationale was for moving swiftly to that enforcement approach? We'd had the benefit, Mr Hodge, of the consumer uh, uh, UCT provisions coming into force in 2010 through 2011. We took a similar approach of dealing with education and outreach there. Um, the lessons we learned from that exercise was uh, the engagement, the outreach, the working with businesses could be drawn out in this area and that we're better to move quickly. Um, so we were very conscious of having a, a much cleaner and tighter handover uh, when it came to business to business UCT. And that was the approach here of 12 months of that engagement, then moving files into an enforcement uh, uh, lens. Right. And I want to then just run through some of the things that the ACCC did in that period from 12 November 2015 to 12 November 2016. There was an education campaign that the Commission undertook. That's right. And what was the nature of that? Uh, it was multifaceted. We uh, uh, engaged with social media, uh, so getting message out through social media uh, activities. Uh, we published guidelines. The guidelines were available from November of 2015. Uh, we undertook a joint webinar uh, with ASIC uh, where we provided uh, a, a discussion uh, a capacity uh, to have with business community and that was taken up well. Uh, we prepared videos. Um, there was two animated videos in particular uh, that were useful in getting the message across. And we continue to use our network of stakeholders. So we have a number of consultative committees that we're able to share information with and get that information through. Uh, what's not named in that statement is we also have a newsletter uh, that goes out to small business and that was also used uh, to make sure we got the message through. And in addition, commissioners and senior staff members were giving speeches about this issue? That's right. So either ones that particularly focused on unfair contract terms, business to business, or those that included uh, it as a component. Um, you've prompted me to mention that media releases were also issued um, quite regularly through that first 12 month period, uh, putting industry on notice. And then there was another aspect of what the ACCC did pre 12 November 2016, which was a contract review. Yeah, an industry you, review of contracts. Could you explain to the Commissioner what that was? Yeah, and this was again based on our experience with the consumer UCT. Um, it was designed to uh, look at some of the contracts in industries that we thought might be of concern uh, based on past complaints or intelligence that we had. Uh, the purpose was that we could get a head start in terms of looking at contracts, improving those, um, uh, but also to use it as an example of uh, identifying problematic clauses, uh, getting the public message out about our issues. Uh, so we looked at six industries when it came to business to business. We uh, identified uh, companies that we might want to approach, uh, received their contracts, reviewed them, and started to engage with those businesses about some of the problematic terms. If I can just take you through some aspects of that. Why did the Commission select the particular six industries that it looked into? Yeah, so um, uh, the six are named there in the statement. Um, they included ones where we had a number of complaints um, now, it's a bit tricky in the sense that before the law came into effect, complaints weren't directly saying UCT, but we could glean from complaints the type of issues that might be there. Uh, we also have uh, fairly good connections uh, through our small business stakeholder groups about the type of uh, matters that come to our attention or that, that might come to our attention. And so those industries were selected based on, on that intelligence as well. And so then having selected those industries, the Commission would approach participants in those industries? That's right. Um, and they were based on um, uh, size and, and profile in the industry. And they, it was voluntary as to whether they participated Correct. or not? And in the end, I think with that recount, it ended up being about 28 that you approached. Does that sound? Well, if I... That's could be 25 pedantic. participated, I think. Yeah. So, so we approached 27. A further party put their hand up to, to join, which was good of them. Um, and ultimately, we had 25 that fully participated, um, the three exclusions being two that chose not to and one that uh, uh, perhaps didn't uh, uh, participate all the way through the process. All right. And the initial approaches that the ACCC made to these industries was when? Uh, those were um, about uh, March of 2016. Right. I think you might, if it assists, we'll bring up paragraph 7.2 of your statement where you say between 31 March 2016 and 27 June 2016, 
the ACCC approach the businesses operating in those selected industries. Correct. And you've then, in paragraph 7.11 of your statement, you've listed some of the businesses that participated. That's page 10 of the statement. 7.11, that's correct. I'm sorry, 7.11. I might just, just say that Commissioner can see what those are. So we see that at the bottom of 7.11, there's five of the companies, Google, Facebook, Fairfax, News Corp, Optus. And then if we go over the page, Vodafone Centre, Vicinity, Baker's Delight, Australia Post, Coca-Cola and Uber. And that's... That's 12, so that's a little less than half of the companies that participated Correct. for it. And then I think you explain at paragraph 8.1D that the process that the Commission went through in order to conduct this review. So could you just take the Commissioner through that? Uh, the, the reference particularly at, at oh, I'm sorry, in, in paragraph 8.1, you explain the process that you went through. Uh, certainly. So um, we received the responses to those first approaches, um, uh, which provided us with contracts. Um, we reviewed those. Um, uh, we analysed to, to determine whether there were concerns there. And then from July to September of 16, uh, we uh, undertook that assessment about whether we had concerns about UCT provisions and ultimately wrote... Uh, to the companies that we had uh, ongoing concerns with. In that period, July to September Correct. 2016. And we can bring up, if we bring up exhibit SG-13, SPG.0001.0001.0001, so this is the template letter that you were, that the ACCC was sending out. That's, to the, that's right. All right. And if we go over the page to page two, you see one of the things that's said in the template letter under the heading enforcement is the small business unfair contract terms law will come into effect on 12 November 2016. The ACCC will be moving to an enforcement approach from this date. And that's consistent with what you've said already about that two stage approach. It is. And you then, or well, the ACCC then published a report on unfair contract terms provisions in small business contracts? That's right. And do you recall when that was published? Uh, that would have been November of 16, just as the law came into effect. All right, and if we bring up SG-12, SPG.0001.0001.0012, this is the report that the ACCC published into the six industries? That's right. And just so the commissioner can get some sense of it, if we go over to, sorry, I said six, seven industries. If we go over to page three of the document, which is dot zero zero one two, oh, that's not very helpful. Page five in the top corner. So this is setting out the summary of what it is that the ACCC does and has been doing. And then as an example, if we go to page seven, this is the beginning of the section on one industry where the ACCC runs through types of clauses in relation to that industry. That's right. All right. And then, Again, if we go to page, I'm going to say page six of that document, we see again this point under enforcing the law. This report marks the conclusion of the ACCC's voluntary compliance and education industry review. As noted above, the small business unfair contract terms law comes into effect on 12 November 2016. From this date, the ACCC will transition to a more focused enforcement approach and will now be targeting businesses that supply standard form contracts to small businesses containing unfair terms. Is that what occurred? Did you 
switch over to an enforcement approach from the 12th of November 2016? Yes, we did. All right. And once it comes to enforcement of the UCT, that must be a little bit different from enforcing contravention provisions of the ACL? For the ACCC, that's right. It's quite a different model. And perhaps if you just help the Commissioner to understand the difference between those two ideas? Um, so many of the provisions in the Australian consumer law are contraventions of the law if you engage in that conduct. With unfair contract terms, um, it's, it's a voidable uh, provision but not actually a contravention of the law. Um, that changes our enforcement approach a little in the sense that if we're engaging with a business and uh, contracts are changed, um, that uh, impacts, I guess, on, on the type of enforcement action we can take after that event. And if we just break down a couple of elements of that, if you've got a contravention provision, one of the remedies that you can obtain from a court is a pecuniary penalty. That's right. Whereas if a, if a business is found to have an unfair contract term in its contract, there's no pecuniary penalty that the ACCC can obtain? Not on first instance. If it's declared uh, unfair yet continued to be enforced, then that might bring in penalties. And so in the first instance, what the ACCC the, the limit of what the ACCC could achieve with enforcement proceedings would be a declaration that the clause is unfair? That's right, and potentially injunctive relief that it uh, not be enforced. And once it's declared to be unfair, then it's void in all contracts in which it's present? Uh, well, that would be subject to, I think, the specific instances um, uh, Sorry, and how we pr proceed with the matter. All right, and then, well, if you, whether you declared it void in relation to the contract with one particular consumer or you approach it on a wider basis. Indeed. And, but if once you've got that declaration and it's declared void, then if the entity was to continue to rely on the clause, then it would be possible for you to seek some sort of pecuniary penalty. That's correct. All right. And whereas if you've got a contravention, then of course, whatever happens, you can get a pecuniary penalty if there's a contravention found. It, that's right. So if, even if the conduct's changed for past behaviour, yeah, you can seek that, uh, that relief. And does it make a difference also to the information gathering powers that the ACCC has? It does. By, by similar exercise, given it's not a contravention in its first instance, the compulsory information gathering powers aren't invoked. Right. And so notwithstanding those limitations in the 16 months since the UCT provisions in the ACL were extended to small businesses. Has the ACCC undertaken an enforcement action in relation to small business unfair contract terms? Yes, we have. And could you perhaps just run us through the types of enforcement action you've taken? Um, so uh, part of the shift from that education compliance was to move um, the focus and the lens in which we look at matters. So matters were then pursued by enforcement teams that sit under my control. Um, that's a more uh, inquisitorial uh, process than, uh, than uh, an engagement strategy. Um, through that, we've obtained a number of administrative resolutions. That's where issues are raised, concerns are raised, and businesses change their conduct. And I think the majority of matters have gone down that path. Uh, but we've also had two matters resolved through the provision of court enforceable undertakings to the ACCC, uh, two matters re uh, which have led to litigation, uh, seeking those declarations you've referred to, and we have a number of matters still under investigation. And in relation to the two matters that have gone to litigation, one of those was against JJ Richards, is that right? That's right, in the waste collection. And that's been, that's gone to conclusion, is that It right? has. And the ACCC obtained a declaration? We did. All right. And in relation to the other matter, is that still ongoing? It's still continuing before the Federal Court. Now, the last topic I'd like to ask you about, Mr Gregson... Before you bond. part from that, take, for example, the JJ Richards uh, case. What period of time are we speaking of if we uh, try to get some measure of inception to conclusion? Uh, how you define inception will be one thing. Conclusion, I can understand, but can you give me some measure of time? Commissioner, are you referring to the investigation? Well, uh, I suspect you start at the investigation and go through to final orders, but 
uh, if you can give me some indication of elapsed times. Um, it can take some time in the investigation phase, even the basics of getting uh, access to the contracts in question, um, ascertaining whether they were in the period, particularly in that transition between pre and post November 2016. From memory, Commissioner, that matter was fairly early on in the piece and it might have been, uh, my recollection is there's about six months through that investigation phase. Once we did commence proceedings, it was uh, resolved remarkably quickly, almost in record time, um, uh, parties consented and the matter was presented to the court quite quickly. Thank you. Did you want to ask anything more about that, no. Commissioner? Thank you. And so when, if I can just confirm one aspect of that, Mr Gregson, when you spoke about the difficulty in getting access to the contracts, <coughs> does that reflect that point you were making before, which is you can't actually exercise your coercive information gathering powers in relation to a potential UCT, failure to comply with the UCT? Oh, that certainly complicates and can extend the investigations. And then the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was the approach, oh, I'm sorry, the second last thing I wanted to talk to you about actually was the funding, which I said I'd return to. So we identified at the outset that the ACCC obtained this initial funding of $1 million and then it now has additional rolling funding of $417,000 per year in relation to UCT compliance for small businesses. Can you give the Commissioner some indication of what effect it would have had if that funding hadn't been obtained on the, the things that the ACCC has done and that we've identified? Yeah, there's no doubt that uh, when new functions are given to regulators, um, the absent of new funding can challenge us as to how we um, uh, undertake those new functions. Though everything uh, in the public service and as a regulator, no doubt other businesses are about setting priorities. Um, so where we do get new functions, uh, we try and deliver resources to them, whether or not we've been given new funding. Um, certainly to have that one million over the first three years greatly assisted uh, with the extent of um, uh, outreach and engagement that we undertook and is providing ongoing assistance to our investigations. Is it, and this may be an impossible question to answer, but if you take, say, the industry review that was done in 2016, is it likely that that would have occurred absent the funding? Yeah, I think so. Um, we, we felt that was a fairly fundamental part of our engagement strategy. Um, we may not have uh, engaged with it to the same extent. Uh, we may have had to cut a few more corners, but I think we probably would have engaged in that activity regardless. And in terms of the enforcement action that you've taken since 12 November 2016, is it likely that the absence of that funding would have had an effect on the enforcement action? Um, we would have had to make um, further individual choices about which matters we could afford to uh, investigate um, and then ultimately pursue. But again, uh, these matters go through a priority mix as they are now. They have to fight against um, other consumer law matters that we take on for, for that priority. Um, I think it's a very high likelihood we would have continued with those matters uh, through the enforcement phase. What you see though, if you do need to make those decisions, is other matters um, uh, may not get pursued uh, in their broader consumer law or other regula uh, regulatory responsibilities. And then the last topic that I wanted to ask you about was an issue that we raised specifically in the rubric, which was the issue of engagement compared to enforcement. And perhaps if I just ask the question generally so that you can start by explaining to the Commissioner, what is the ACCC's attitude to how it should decide between should it engage with industries or should it be commencing or undertaking enforcement action? Uh, well, certainly when new laws come into effect, particularly if they're um, significant changes, such as the introduction of unfair contract terms, first with consumer and then with business to business, uh, we do think that prevention is better than cure, uh, providing that education and outreach is an important part of getting that awareness and change that you want. The ACCC does, however, uh, have a model and a belief though that uh, deterrence through enforcement um, and uh, leveraging off that is, is one of its effective tools um, to ensure broader compliance in an industry. So we will invariably move at some point, uh, even with new laws, to, to an enforcement approach. And 
in that enforcement approach, there might be different things that are thought of in enforcement. One is court proceedings, which is what you've referred to. There are other tools available, like infringement notices and enforceable undertakings. Does the ACCC regard those as being part of enforcement? Yeah, very much. And, and even short of infringement notices and undertakings, which we treat as part of our more formal resolutions, those administrative resolutions where we've investigated, we get results, um, uh, whether we refer to those publicly or not, they're still part of the uh, investigation enforcement phase and hopefully uh, a leverage to, to have greater compliance. And does the ACCC have a view as to how it should strike a balance between using infringement notices or enforceable undertakings and litigation? Oh, we do. Um, we each year issue our compliance and enforcement policy, which sets out not only our priorities for the year ahead, uh, but the way in which we treat those different enforcement um, uh, remedies. Um, that sort of sets out that we will take the most serious of matters, um, uh, the greatest detriment matters through to litigation and prepare to resolve the less serious matters through undertakings and uh, infringement notices. That's a relative exercise. When I say less serious, they're still often quite serious matters. And what is the value of court proceedings in the Commission's view? Uh, well, court proceedings are the only way to get penalties, so outside the UCT context, and so um, we think that penalties are an important part of the deterrence message for greater compliance. Um, they also bring a greater uh, sanction, um, the concept of going to court, um, establishing your case and having findings of the court um, assist in um, uh, demonstrating uh, how the law applies and uh, the deterrence impact it needs to have. Commissioner, did you have some Can I just go back to the compliance and enforcement policy? Did you say that's uh, reviewed annually? That's correct. May I ask why it's seen as something that is uh, appropriate to look at each year? What, what are the drivers that make it an annual uh, uh, thing to look at rather than uh, once for a period? Thank you, Commissioner. The primary reason is it also sets our priorities for the year and that changes year by year. We get a, a strategic review process of analysing intelligence about the type of matters we should look at. Um, but we do also review some of those more policy issues about when we might take enforcement action and the different types of enforcement action. Um, we do think that's a living document because part of the purpose of that document is to communicate with the regulated community. And if we are adjusting our approach, uh, we, we like to try and refine that in, 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 our, in our policy. Yes. So there is one other thing I ought to ask. Does the, does the size of the entity that you're dealing with make a difference as to whether you're going to use any particular enforcement mechanism against them? <laughs> Uh, well, it does on a couple of fronts. Um, if we are to provide deterrence, obviously larger companies may need a higher deterrence and that might mean that we go to court. Um, the footprint of larger companies also say something about the harm that we're trying to address. Um, if a large company has a greater impact on the marketplace with its behaviour, um, that might be something that adds to the seriousness uh, of the conduct. Um, we're also the national regulator. Uh, we tend to focus in on the big end of town uh, more than the lower end of town. We work closely with our state uh, fair trading uh, colleagues um, who we uh, uh, rely on to assist with the, the smaller end. Thank you. Commissioner, I don't have any more questions for Mr yes. Gregson. Thank you. Does any party seek leave to examine Mr Gregson? No? Anything in no, you no, wish no. to take up? No. no. Mr Gregson could be excused. Thank you, Mr Gregson. You may step down. You're Thank excused you. attendance. Now, Mr Hodge, at what time do we need to begin tomorrow? Commissioner, it would be my preference to begin at 9.30 if that's not no. inconvenient to you. 9.30 it is, uh, Mr Hodge. Adjourn until 9.30 tomorrow morning. Okay.